Howdy folks, this is the additional information I promised on the DIY home body scanner project. We already went over modifying the feed horn in the other video, but now we have to get it onto the screen. I used an FPGA in my project, but you could use a PC also. In this block diagram, you can see the first thing we do with the signal after it comes out of the feed horn is we amplify it. I chose to use a single chip instrumentation amplifier from analog devices for two reasons. One, it was on my desk in a piece of foam already. That's how engineering happens sometimes. And secondly, I didn't have to wire a bunch of op amps to get it to work. Here's the schematic. The signal comes from a coax from the feed horn, passes through a DC blocking capacitor and into the instrumentation amplifier. A resistor is used to set the gain of the amplifier between 1 to 10,000. The lower the resistance, the higher the gain, with the 50 ohm minimum. So I put a 50 ohm resistor in series with my potentiometer. The device requires a negative rail, so I used a 9 volt battery and a resistor divider to make a virtual ground. Not the most ideal, but it works in this situation. For prototyping amplifiers like this, I like to use batteries because it takes all the question out of whether the power supply is clean or not. The virtual ground is tied to the system ground, and the supply rails are decoupled to the virtual ground. If you wanted to do your processing through a PC, you could stop with the electronics at this point and add a DC blocking capacitor and hook it up to your sound card's audio input. I decided for the sake of rapid prototyping, I'd hook mine to an FPGA through a 10-bit analog-to-digital converter. Unfortunately, this time I had to get up from my desk and go over to my parts bin. I found several devices with parallel interfaces, but I really didn't need that kind of speed, and I really didn't need to spend all that time wiring it up. I really didn't want to. Luckily, I found this part from Microchip Technologies that only had a 5-pin package and an I2C interface. It was in a pretty small package, but I drank a cup of coffee and I was ready to go. I built this off the C1 developer board that I helped design a few years ago. There's the VGA port. This is the FPGA. This is the mezzanine card that I built on top of the Geek port. And there's the 9 volt battery. Before I could start using the data from the analog to digital converter and the feed horn, I had to get the video generation working. The electrical signaling that's used in almost every pixel-style display can be traced back to the early days of television. When I was a kid, we had these things called CRTs with a cathode that streamed electrons, and they were accelerated and passed through a yoke with electromagnets that deflected the electron beam, which struck a phosphor screen, and then the electrons were returned to the anode cap. The beam starts sweeping at the upper left and sweeps from left to right. When it reaches the right side, it has to retrace back. And this is the blanking period where the electron beam moves back to the left side and then sweeps back to the right. When the beam reaches the bottom, it needs to retrace back to the top, so there's a blanking period there too. During the blanking period, the electron beam is squelched or blanked so that you can't see the retrace. Here's a cute example of a CRT. You can see the anode cap on the side, the phosphor, right here on the front, and the cathode where the electron stream from is in the back. And this is the yoke down the middle with a horizontal and vertical deflection coil. For a VGA monitor, these are the signals we need to generate. A red, green, blue analog signal, horizontal and vertical sync, and internally a vertical and horizontal blanking signal. The RGB signals are three wires. These analog signals will control the electron gun inside the CRT. Higher voltages are brighter pixels, and lower voltages are darker pixels. During every scan line, we need to generate a horizontal sync signal and also blank the pixels to the black level. As mentioned before, this is used to prevent the retrace from being seen. Between each horizontal sync signal represents one scan line. The time between each scan line is dependent on the type of monitor that you're driving. When you reach the bottom of the screen, the vertical sync will be asserted for several scan lines. You also need to blank the RGB because there's also a retrace that happens here. You might be thinking, oh Jerry, we have LCDs now, all this CRT stuff is irrelevant. It just so happens that RGB is a very efficient way bandwidth wise to transmit video information and LCDs still use RGB. The physical interface to the VGA connector is pretty simple. It's an R2R ladder for each of the red, green, and blue each of which that has a single transistor emitter follower as a buffer, and a straight connection for the horizontal and vertical sync pins. All the timing is controlled by two counters, a horizontal and a vertical counter. The horizontal counter counts pixels, and in my case I was using a 32 megahertz pixel clock. The counter gets reset at the end of the scan line plus blanking period. 
Signals such as resets are generated by comparators that are monitoring the horizontal and vertical counter. Every time the horizontal counter is reset, the vertical counter is incremented by one, meaning one more scan line. Horizontal and vertical sinks and blanking are generated by comparators also that set and reset flip-flops. Now that we have the video timing done, we can make a frame buffer. I chose in this Altera part to just use block memories with a dual port configuration, one in and one out port. For each of these ports, there's an address associated with it and a data in or a data out. I formed the two-dimensional frame buffer by concatenating parts of the horizontal and vertical counter. As the counter increases, the corresponding pixels will be fetched. Pixels are written into the frame buffer from the analog to digital converter state machine. The location they're stored is determined by the mouse input from the mouse state machine, which is tracking the XY location. And the final component is the blanking mux. This determines the black level and is driven by the horizontal and vertical blanking registers. Analog to digital converter needs to be initialized by sending a byte across the I squared C interface. I did this with a fixed state machine. Once the I squared C device acknowledges the byte, it will send out a continuous stream of bytes back, which is the data. The state machine captures these bits, concatenates them into a word, and acknowledges each of the bytes. The PS2 mouse interface is similar, but easier. You just have to send one byte, and then it streams continuously the X and Y differential. These values are signed, so you add them to an X and Y accumulator, and you can track where you are on the screen. And that's all it takes. Analog signals come in to the analog to digital converter, get converted to I squared C, they're received by the FPGA, which puts them into the frame buffer. The VGA video sync generator and address generator fetches these values from the frame buffer and asserts them onto the red, green, blue R2R ladders to generate the analog voltages for the display. For those of you that are curious what an HDL or hardware definition language looks like, this is Verilog. This is how the horizontal counter is defined. There's an always block that's sensitive to the clock and the negative edge of the reset line. During the transition of either one of these signals, the contents of this always block will be evaluated. Remember, in hardware, everything's evaluated simultaneously. So it's a quite a bit different than programming in a sequential language like C, for instance. If reset is asserted low, then the horizontal counter is cleared. You can see that it is signed 12 1 bits of 0. By the way, H counter was defined or declared outside of this block as 12 bits. On the positive edge of the clock, the horizontal counter will be updated only if the horizontal counter is not at the end of the line. Otherwise, it will be cleared. EOL, or end of line, was defined as a parameter outside of this block. It's just a constant. Since everything's evaluated simultaneously in hardware, anything that's lower on the page will override anything that's higher on the page. For instance, the horizontal counter will not index if the condition of H counter equals EOL. It will get cleared and will never index. This is very powerful because you can make as much parallel hardware as you want as long as it fits within your device and it all runs simultaneously. Okay, I'll stop boring you with all this stuff. If you want to contact me, reach me at scorch.chips at gmail.com. I'm always looking for suggestions, design work, or if you have uh, some event I should know about.